Hello, I'm Dr. DeBellis, and today I'd like to talk to you about the physiological psychology behind emotions, aggression, and stress. Um, this is a really important topic. Sometimes when we get into uh, more scientific courses, we kind of lose sight of the significance of emotions, what their value is. In fact, um, I remember listening to a uh, to a well-known neuropsychologist by the name of Ronald Roof once give a presentation on doing therapy. And he made this profound statement. He said, in industrialized nations, there's an average of about 10,000 hours that an individual spends learning reading, writing, and arithmetic, becoming proficient at those three um, areas. When it comes to emotions, how much time do we spend? Um, for most people, it's probably zero. Maybe you have a few courses if you're living in Northern California and you're in elementary school, but for the most part, we don't really talk about the significance of emotions, and it's really a bad thing. I never forget once I uh, was listening to somebody, uh, they saw a book of mine that was called Empirical Analysis of Emotional Intelligence, and they made the comment, it sounds like an oxymoron to me. And it's really sad because um, clearly it was never imparted upon this individual that emotions are extremely important for us, especially as children. Um, so I want to talk about why they're important and what they are. So an emotion is a subjective mental state that's usually accompanied by distinctive behaviors and involuntary physiological changes. It's comprised of actions, uh, motivations, physiological arousal, as well as feelings. Um, when I say actions, emotions compel us to act, right? If you're feeling really scared, freezing is the action. Um, it, they also affect motivation. They motivate us to pursue or avoid outcomes, right? If uh, we say something that is reinforced in conversation, it motivates us to talk more, right? Um, there's also the physiological arousal when we look at things like uh, heart rate, respiration, um, and those are correlated with emotions. Clearly, if somebody's very angry, uh, they're going to have higher levels or if they're very scared. Um, and then finally, the subjective private feelings. And, these are usually what we're more preoccupied with whenever we're, we're doing talk therapy. These are really important. So there was a patient once. She was first described in 1994. Uh, she had exclusive and complete bilateral amygdala destruction since uh, late childhood. This was due to a rare genetic condition called erbach white disease. Um, down below you can actually see a, a picture. Um, the center picture, the red part is the amygdala. You have two of them actually. You can see them in the far right picture. But yeah, hers were not um, there. They were destroyed. And as a result, some of the behavioral manifestations that we see is a lack of fear. She was very outgoing, extremely friendly. She's also very disinhibited. She also had de impaired declarative memory facilitation for emotional material. She was poor at reading negative social cues. And uh, she would violate personal space. That means uh, she wouldn't give people enough personal space. She would, uh, as they say in therapy, get in other people's bubble. Um, and she was not bothered whenever people got into her bubble. So it's like she did not have normal um, boundaries with other people. And all of this was related to the fact that her amygdala were destroyed. Um, we're going to discuss the significance of the amygdala um, and, and how they play a, a key role in our ability to appraise the um, uh, things that are, that are scary or make us nervous or angry. Before we do that, I want to talk about the history of emotions, our understanding of emotions. So the first theory that ever came along was folk psychology. And folk psychology posited that 
autonomic responses are caused by emotions. So if you hear somebody say, I was so angry, my stomach was churning. This would be somebody who ascribes to folk psychology. Now the James Lang theory was a more progressive theory that, that posited that the opposite was the case. The emotions we feel are caused by the bodily changes. And uh, um, emotions differ due to different physiological responses. Um, so the folk psychology and James Lang theory um, approaches to understanding emotions are opposites of one another. Now the Cannon-Bard theory was a newer theory that posited that after we perceive an event, maybe you witness something that's scary, you experience simultaneous physiological reactions such as perspiration or heightened heart rate, as well as an emotional experience. And that the cerebral cortex decides on the emotional response and also slowly activates the sympathetic response. The final theory was the cognitive attribution model. And this was by Stanley Schachter. You've probably heard of the epinephrine studies. Um, according to the cognitive attribution model, physiological responses are interpreted in terms of the stimuli and an emotional state results from the interaction of physiological activation as well as cognitive interpretation. Now in his research, on the epinephrine studies, um, he would have pe uh, subjects who were waiting in a room um, were actually given epinephrine, and in the control group they were not given epinephrine. There were two different types of experimental groups. In one experimental group, someone, a confederate, sitting next to the um, participant would actually talk about how annoying something is. In the other condition, the subject who got an injection of the epinephrine would um, talk, uh, the confederate would talk about how um, exciting something was. And what they found was individuals who did not receive epinephrine didn't have that strong of a reaction to what they were being told by the confederate. However, subjects who were given epinephrine experienced more um, anger about the angry, the angry situation that was described to them, or if they were next confederate who talked about how exciting something is, they would report that it was more exciting. So it seems like the heightened level of arousal caused by epinephrine, also called adrenaline, was actually um, misattributed to receiving the epinephrine. So the same... Um, neurotransmitter would actually cause different reactions depending on what you heard. This was also consistent with Dutton and Aaron's research in 1974 in which subjects would um, meet a confederate on a bridge. You would have either the bridge on the left, which uh, was a very um, thin, dangerous bridge. It's not secure. It was a suspension bridge. Or the bridge over on the right, which is much more secure. It's really solid. You could probably drive a car over that. It has really solid, non-swaying, supported um, walls. So these were the two types of bridges. And the first bridge was rickety and sways and narrow and gives off the feeling of excitement. The other bridge is like the one in the park. It's wide, gives us a peaceful feeling. Then participants were approached on the bridge by a female who was assigned as a attractive female, whatever that means, and then they interacted with the female. And after the interaction, the female left, and they were to indicate their likeliness to contact her in the future. And they found that those on the rickety and narrow bridge found the female more attractive and were more likely to contact her as well in the future. And uh, this corresponds with the cognitive attribution theory. Um, in response to the epinephrine levels, increasing in a more excited or feared state, increasing the levels of attraction. So, as you can see, heightened levels of arousal can actually be misattributed to um, things that we view. We, we don't really realize that, that our 
um, heart rate goes up so much. We're, we're, we, we believe that um, it's the things that we see and we attribute it to that. So you've probably heard about the polygraph. So research shows different patterns of autonomic responses according to the positive or negative emotions. However, we have problems um, with the polygraph. Um, the polygraph measures bodily responses, but it's not reliable. In a polygraph test, multiple physiological measures are recorded on the assumption that lying produces an emotional and physiological response. It measures respiratory rate, it measures sweatiness of fingertips, and it also measures blood pressure, heart rate. The problem with the polygraph is the polygraph has too many false positives. What I mean by that is it will misinterpret any emotion as lying. For instance, um, one of the strategies that's actually used to manipulate, to trick the polygraph, is to put a pin in your shoe and to actually align it so you can put pressure on the tip of the pin with your toe. That forces you to experience pain. When you experience pain, your respiratory rate, sweatiness of fingertips, and blood pressure all go up. Um, the first lie detector was probably an ostrich egg. It was used in, um, in Africa many years ago. And the reason that it was used was if somebody was on trial, if they broke the ostrich egg, it would mean that they were tense, therefore they were lying. Um, just like our polygraphs that we use today, um, it suffers from um, an overabundance of false positives due to the fact that it can't differentiate which emotion it is. It's one of the reasons that it's not used in a court of law in criminal cases. Um, there's a really good book by Paul Ekman, who we're going to talk about in more detail, where he actually explains that one of the problems with the polygraph is there were people who were convicted of crimes they didn't commit partly because of the polygraph, which showed they lied. Um, they would look at pictures of, of people um, who had been mutilated, and they would be given the polygraph about whether or not they, they actually committed the crime. And the problem was that some of them didn't actually mutilate the victims in the pictures they were looking at, but they did find it arousing to look at the bodies. Therefore, that was misinterpreted as they're lying when they said that they did not actually do the crime. So, now physiological responses are different for positive emotions, but they're more similar for the negative emotions. Uh, and this is the reason, again, that polygraphs are often unhelpful for distinguishing liars from anxious innocents. Now, functional MRI, which again is a combination of structural and functional uh, brain imaging, it may prove more useful. Functional MRI shows activation of the anterior cingulate um, whenever an individual is lying. Um, oftentimes we see more frontal lobe activity because as you know, when you lie, you have to really plan. It involves a lot of judgment. In the words of Mark Twain, he was never a liar because it's too difficult to lie because you have to keep track of all these different versions of reality, and he prefers one version. Um, so, now when we talk about how many emotions we experience, it goes back to an individual by the name of Robert Plutchek. He was one of the first uh, psychoevolutionary theorists that talked about the significance of emotions. This is his theory here. So his theory is that we have um, four pairs of opposites, joy versus sadness, affection versus disgust, anger versus fear, and expectation versus surprise. And each of these varies in their intensity as well. We would call really intense sadness grief. We would call low-grade sadness pensiveness. But he felt that you could look at these and you could actually get a better understanding of why we have certain social institutions based on emotions. For instance, he felt that individuals who um, have a lot of anger, um, that those individuals um, 
tend to be quarrelsome in personality. So we'd maybe say they're more neurotic. Um, the adaptive function of anger, and remember, even anger is adaptive in some ways. If you read uh, Why Anger Hurts by Matthew McKay, one of the first points that he makes is that appropriate anger is a really good thing. People are overstepping your boundaries or people are, are not being treating you in a dignified way. That little bit of anger, the annoyance, is probably an adaptive thing that tells you that somebody needs to stop doing something or you need to avoid them. Um, but the behavioral expression at the more extreme level is going to be attacking. And uh, um, he also felt that um, at its diagnostic extreme, um, these individuals are seen as aggressive. And the ego defense regulatory process would be displacement. And the coping style would be substitution. And that the social control institutions for excessive anger are police, war, and sports. Um, interesting combination there. Keep in mind some theorists say that um, sports are to war what pornography is to sex. They're, they're very similar. Um, so that was aggression. We can also look at the other, or that was anger. We can also look at the different emotions and we can actually look at what their adaptive function is. Um, and then we can look at the personality trait and the institutions we have. For instance, one of them that we have is sadness. Well, it helps us adapt by reintegrating, and uh, people can be gloomy as a result of it. However, um, if we look at it on a diagnostic extreme, of course it's going to be depression, and the way that people um, uh, cope with it is oftentimes replacement, right? And the social control institution, according to Plutchek, would be religion. And oftentimes, whenever individuals lose someone or they endure a great loss, religion is something that brings them a great deal of respite. Um, so um, it's really interesting to look at these individuals who tend to um, be more, for instance, um, Dis disgusted, tend to be more likely to um, receive medicine. They tend to be more paranoid. This is probably alluding to conditions like paranoid schizophrenia. Um, so it's really interesting. The obsessive compulsive is the diagnostic extreme for um, um, uh, expectation. However, science seems like it's the social control institution. So have a look at these charts. They're really useful. They're not in your text. These charts are actually from another book called The Owner's Manual for the Brain. It's a really cool book. Um, now, the foremost expert at this point <coughs> is um, Paul Ekman in the area of emotions. Paul Ekman's research indicates there might be seven distinctive Universal facial expressions for anger, sadness, happiness, fear, disgust, surprise, contempt, and embarrassment. And these different emotions can be detected in facial expressions that are similar across cultures. When we met in person for our, our lectures, I would oftentimes um, do his training program uh, in class. And uh, it's challenging because when you do Paul Ekman's um, emotional training, facial recognition program, oftentimes what you're looking for is something he calls a micro-expression. So he found that across cultures, facial expressions are universal. Um, the way he discovered this is he uh, worked with a really isolated um, group of people in the, the tribe of Papua New Guinea. They don't interact with people from other tribes, so they're sort of um, disconnected from the rest of the world. And he looked at videos of them, recordings, reels of recordings, and uh, he analyzed their facial expressions and he noticed that they have the same facial expressions. If they see a little kid and they're excited, they smile. Um, if they see something bad that scares them, maybe, you know, there's a snake next to the kid, they might, you know, show the same exact uh, uh, look of fear. Um, or if they 
if they see something else, they, they would experience disgust or anger or surprise in the same way that um, individuals from other cultures would. So Paul Ekman uh, felt that there was like good support for the idea that human emotions are universal. And uh, he also discovered something else. Whenever he was looking at these facial expression videos and he was slowing them down, looking at a tenth of a second at a time, he discovered that there were these brief um, facial expressions that seemed like they were actually more authentic than the regular facial expressions. Now, we know now that these are micro-expressions, that for a moment you have sort of an authentic emotional expression on your face, but then it's followed by a socially um, appropriate emotion, especially here in the United States, by the way. You see, um, I had this uh, opportunity um, in San Francisco to work with this really large team of clinicians and a group of them were actually specialized in speaking different languages from China. And, and like the group of them spoke all these different languages. They sort of like 50 different languages in China. Pretty amazing. Those are major languages in China. Um, well, they did something that was different than I was accustomed to. They would say, um, are you okay? What happened? Something wrong? then I'd feel kind of self-conscious because usually that's not how we introduce ourselves or greet somebody here in the United States. Usually we say, hey, how you doing? Hey, it's a great weather out there. And we say things like, oh, I'm doing fantastic. How's your family? Oh, they're doing great. And no one has the nerve to say, doing horrible. I'm sleep deprived got a colicky baby at home you know <laughs> I'm locked up it's 2020 shelter in place we got no air conditioning I'm doing horrible we don't do that here in the states it's more common to say I'm doing great and then the other person says I'm doing fantastic too so um we have display rules that we use right however there's a brief period of about a quarter of a second where the genuine emotion is revealed, right? So um, if you find out you were right about something, but it's socially inappropriate to say, I was right, um, you know, for a moment we have a genuine emotion. Um, and this is demonstrated if you do the trainings with Paul Ekman and his group. Um, for instance, they talked about, uh, they give the example of Marsha, Marsha Clark um, cross examining Cato Kalin during the O.J. Simpson trial. And at one point, she tries to impeach his character. She tries to discredit him by saying, so, I hear you got a great book deal out of this. And uh, Cato Kalin looks, and he smiles, and he says, I don't, don't know what you're talking about, but, yeah. Um, but if you slow it down to where you're looking at tenths of a second in, at per frame, um, what you actually find out is... Uh, Cato Kalin's facial expression he goes more like this. He goes, or he, he, he scowls. He basically scowls, and uh, then for like a quarter of a second, he scowls, and then he smiles. So that little scowl that he had, like, you're going to ruin this for me, Marsha, um, that was actually a micro-expression. And we have um, seven primary emotions. One of those was removed, embarrassment. The primary emotions are anger, sadness, happiness, fear, disgust, surprise, and contempt. And uh, they each have their own unique profile. Um, now, there's cross-cultural similarity, as I talked about, in expression production. But there are culture-specific differences in display. And the extent of cultural influence is under debate. But attempts to mask the display of emotion give rise to this phenomenon which Ekman calls microexpressions. Um, he has a group of people that are um, classified as wizards, meaning that they're proficient at identifying microexpressions even without formal training. Uh, this is the prevalence of this ability to, in untrained people is 50 people in 20,000. Again, you can use his facial 
decoding program to learn how to do this pretty well um, over the course of a few hours. But it seems like the role of facial expressions um, is a paralinguistic function. It's an accessory to communication. It provides us with a lot of valuable information. Um, and Antonio Damasio talked about this a lot. He wrote a really good book that's called Looking for Spinoza, in which he talks about emotions, and he talks about how we have many different emotions. We have social emotions. We have the um, evaluative emotions, we have background emotions, we have primary emotions, um, but they have a paralinguistic role. They tell us information. And if you can harness that ability, it's really useful. For instance, uh, Paul Ekman talks about a uh, facial expression called duping delight. Duping delight is a certain constellation of um, different facial emotions that is exhibited, when, exhibited whenever an individual has deceived one and they just got indication that they succeeded. So I remember seeing this once in a colleague. A colleague uh, had made a mistake and I said, oh, that was my fault. And there was this brief display for a quarter of a second of duping delight where they were really happy that I was actually going to take credit for something that was done incorrectly. Um, it's really useful for you to be able to analyze these. So just a little background on the physiology of emotions. So we have two categories of facial mus muscles. We have the superficial facial muscles which attach to the skin. Um, then we have the deep facial muscles, which attach to the skeletal structures in the head. So if somebody, for instance, uh, um, uh, uh, sticks out their, their jaw or something like that, we're more likely seeing these deep facial muscles. Now, facial muscles are innervated by two cranial nerves, facial nerve, which is cranial nerve 7, and the trigeminal nerve, which is cranial nerve 5. Um, we were talking about the facial feedback hypothesis, and this probably would be better placed back there. This was uh, by Davis, I believe, Davis et al. What they did is they had individuals watch a really zany comedy. What do I mean by zany? Well, something kind of offbeat, kind of strange. One of those things that a lot of people would think is kind of weird. Maybe, I don't know, maybe Tom Green kind of humor. You know, it's just really bizarre. And uh, participants were divided into two groups, two experimental groups. And one, they would take chopsticks and they would hold them like that. Um, and the other one, they would hold them sideways, like they were smiling. And then afterward, individuals who held the chopsticks so that they're pointing out reported that it was not that interesting or funny of a comedy and they were unlikely to watch other comedies by that comedian. Individuals who held the chopsticks Sideways, which um, imitates the, the movements recruited for smiling, those individuals reported that the co comedian was much more friendly than the other group. They even went as far as to say that they'd be likely to um, watch the comedian on their own time if they ever had any links to any of their work. Now, impairment of facial expression may limit social interaction and inhibition of facial muscles may be caused by Parkinson's disease or by schizophrenia. Now, Bell's palsy, which we can see here, is caused by a virus, and it can cause partial, partial facial paralysis. Usually it resolves. Oftentimes it resolves over the course of uh, several months. Um, sometimes it doesn't, and it's really sad because um, oftentimes the individual looks like they might be contemptuous because um, that facial expression does look like contempt, even though that's actually intended to be a smile, which is only on one side. So, Charles Darwin actually noted the similarity in facial musculature and nerves in human and non-human primates, and he even suggested that expression and emotion came from a common ancestor. And of course, ethological studies show how Natural selection has sha shaped behavior. According to uh, the ethologist uh, David Buss, 
emotions may coordinate responses to solving adaptive problems. Um, if somebody's in class and the professor's giving them too many difficult problems and the person begins crying, are students more likely to say, hey doc, is there any chance that we can maybe get her some water and like maybe, you know, kind of, you know, they try to redirect the behavior. Or if you see somebody is fearful, sometimes it helps people to um, take a more active role in protecting them, right? Um, so emotions may coordinate responses, uh, you know, when somebody's in a state of panic or when they're sad, other people will be more likely to comfort them. Um, cooperating with a group, choosing a mate, and avoiding predators may have required emotional adaptation. Another really important thing that we have to consider is emotions are really important for raising children. What do I mean by that? I'll tell you right now, it is so difficult sometimes to go to work whenever my kids are doing cute things or to focus on my work when my kids are doing cute things. Kids are so good at stealing attention because they're designed to be so darn cute. And because of our emotions, because of the joy that we feel, because of the laughter, because of how cute they are, how fond we are, the way that we feel, as well as the behaviors that they engage in that are just so cute, it's just beyond belief. Some of the things that they, they will actually do, um, sometimes it's so cute, you just can't help but interact with them. I'll never forget one time uh, we were in a really nice restaurant and there was somebody who left their telephone on really loud and my uh, one-year-old screamed when they heard the telephone, hello! And a lot of people in the restaurant all laughed because they heard this one-year-old yelling hello. That gets them attention. Well, why is that so important that they get attention? Because the best commodity for a one-year-old is interaction because that way they can refine their language skills. And your language skills are basically what um, determine how well you're going to do with regard to academic success, intelligence. It's all based on language. Even if you're a nonverbal person, language skills are the primary foundation of other intellectual skills. And uh, whenever babies are super cute and they cause these emotional reactions, they basically trick us into giving them more language practice. So that's another really important role of emotions. Here we have, that's uh, my son Leo and my daughter. And as you can see, they're doing cute things, interacting with each other. And uh, that allows them to build their interpersonal and social skills. Now, some emotions are present at birth by nine months. All basic emotions are present. And between 18 to 24 months, um, self-awareness develops along with embarrassment, empathy, and envy. And then finally, evaluative emotions such as pride and guilt um, and shame develop by two to three years. Um, once a student asked me what's the difference between shame and guilt, um, shame's a private emotion. If there's something you did and nobody knows about it, you experience shame. If it's something that everybody's aware of, you feel guilt. Um, but these develop by two to three years. There you can see um, my son at the top, smiling, um, happy. There's my daughter there. She's feeling pride. She just figured out how to do a new puzzle. She's clapping for herself and she's using the key phrase of Montessori school, which is, I can do it. <laughs> That's the, the thing they focus on. Every day they learn that they can do something new. And uh, from an Ericksonian standpoint, that teaches them uh, a sense of industry. Um, it was noticed a long time ago in a delivery, in a, in, in a NICU, or a NIC unit that um, babies, some babies are inconsolable whenever you take their vitals, change their diaper, just turn them over, to take their temperature. They just, they lose their marbles. Um, and uh, 
the nurses joked about, so do you think that these, uh, this one kid who's having like all these issues and nobody can console them, do you think they're going to go on later in life to have road rage and, you know, have to talk to Dr. Freud? Like, um, eventually Lacey and Lacey came up with research in this particular area, and they call this the individual response stereotype, the tendency of individuals to have the same response patterns throughout their lives. This was confirmed, for instance, agoraphobia was 34% more prevalent in these high reactives. So infants who are high reactives with exceptionally strong reactions later had uh, increased rates of fear responses as well as phobias. I've always been fascinated with this. That's my son there. Um, and there's a toy spider. Um, so this individual response stereotypes the tendency of individuals to have the same response patterns throughout their lives. Um, so with my son and my daughter, one of the things I've always been fascinated with is um, my daughter saw her first mechanical spider that looked realistic when she was um, um, young. I showed it to her. And I was interested, if I acted like it's really cute and petted it, like, would she think that it's cute? The reason I was interested in this, I actually did have a friend um, once when I was younger who, she had a son who was I think, two and a half years of age, and he picked up a large beetle and showed it to his mom. She looked and she screamed. She was really scared of the beetle. And then he began crying, and from that point on, he was afraid of bugs. We call this a genetic predisposition. It's consistent with the idea that, you know, little Albert could easily be conditioned to be afraid of scorpions. I don't think they actually did that. But when it came to conditioning him to be afraid of fluffy white things like bunny rabbits, it was very difficult to condition him. So um, I was interested, you know, would my daughter end up being afraid? of um, a spider if she didn't see a fear reaction. And um, she actually was. Um, and I have to say, my, my daughter is less fearful and timid than my son. That's my son there. My daughter's all about, you know, go, go, go. He's all about be careful. Um, and there he is with the toy spider. And he doesn't even seem to be that, you know, phased by the toy spider. Of course, this is not a realistic walking one. So I guess the jury's still out on this, uh, but it does seem like there are biological predispositions. On a side note, once she did get, see, get to see a snake up close when uh, she was really young and we were in the pet store, and she, she did not want anything to do with that. She said, that looks like a no fun sandwich. Well, she said it with her face. Of course, she couldn't speak that well yet. Now, brain stimulation studies have also been um, used to study emotions as well as, you know, circuits that mediate emotions. And uh, these brain self-stimulation uh, studies refer to animals working to provide electrical stimulation to their brain. So um, it's also possible in humans, and we do have studies where human beings will self-stimulate to activate certain parts of the brain. And brain sites that respond to self-stimulation have been mapped. Not surprisingly, they're going to involve a lot of dopaminergic pathways, um, as well as other um, neurotransmitters. But the main ones, and again, we could call this the medial forebrain bundle, um, the big neurotransmitter for this is going to be um, dopaminergic pathways. And in this particular um, diagram here, the um, dopaminergic pathways um, are going to originate in this, uh, this um, orange area. You don't need to memorize this. This is uh, actually a rat brain. So it doesn't look like a human brain very much. They're very different. So the medial forebrain bundle, here's a human brain, um, is a tract that arises from the midbrain through the hypothalamus and contains many sites for self-stimulation. And uh, in the nucleus accumbens, again, that's where the caudate nucleus meets the putamen, it's an important target in the dopaminergic circuit. So um, I'm going to draw what this would look like here. Um, 
So basically, this is this VTA is the um, ventral tegmental area, right? And then that nucleus accumbens is um, going to be over here, this red area, and uh, the dopaminergic projections make it to that area. And then um, the dopamine makes its way up into higher areas too. And this is how we make distinctions between different subtle forms of pleasure. Um, now, brain lesions can also affect emotions. Um, Sherrington uh, studied um, decorticate um, dogs, for instance. These were dogs that would actually have their um, uh, cortexes removed, and he wanted to see if they could still experience emotions or whether emotional you know, experience was was uh, confined to the cortex and whether removing the cortex would eliminate emotional experience. So what he found with the decortical, decorticate dogs was a sudden intense rage in the dogs with their cortex removed, um, suggesting the cortex inhibits rage. This is not surprising. The cortex does inhibit um, our behavior particularly, especially the orbital prefrontal gyrus. Now the PAPE circuit, um, interconnected is a interconnected brain regions within the limbic system, and uh, it's really important for um, emotions. It was originally thought it was just for um, uh, memory, but we know now PAPE circuit is extremely important for um, emotions. Um, here's a picture of what PAPE circuit would look like. So again, these are limbic structures. This is the cingulate gyrus here. We have the amygdala here. We have the, um, what other areas do we have here? So the basal forebrain nuclei, these are all going to be really important, especially though the amygdala and the cingulate gyrus are super important for um, uh, the experience of emotions. Now, whenever somebody has an encephalopathy or some kind of condition that targets um, PAPE circuit, it can result in Kluver-Busey syndrome. I've actually seen this in humans. It's characterized by emotional changes such as reduction of fear and anxiety, and it's typically experienced after bilateral amygdala damage. And uh, further studies recognize the amygdala um, located in the temporal lobe as, as being the key structure that mediates fear. So these individuals will actually um, whenever they have damage to their amygdala, they will actually become hypersexual, hyperoral. Thinking of, I had a patient who um, was actually eating things. He was putting things in his mouth. He put a paper clip in his mouth. He would put earwax in his mouth. And this was probably because of the amygdala ablation that he had experienced with the Kluver-Busey syndrome. Now, classical conditioning can elicit fear by pairing a stimulus with an aversive, um, uh, pairing a neutral stimulus with an aversive stimulus, like a shock, and eventually the um, first stimulus by itself can produce fear. The unconditioned stimulus will become conditioned to elicit fear. A great example of this would be um, if you're training your pet um, not to step out the door. I know some people think it's really mean, but there are some people who don't want their feline to leave the house because they're not in a safe place for a feline to be an outdoor cat. So what they'll do is they'll spray their cat with a spray bottle whenever the cat steps out the door. Now at some point, they might actually put a clicker on the spray bottle. So there's a distinctive click. Um, associating the clicker um, with the feeling of being sprayed would be an example of this um, pairing the stimulus with an aversive stimulus. And eventually, you don't even have to fill the water bottle. You can just hit the clicker and the cat will freeze or it will retreat back into the house um, where it's safer. So now different regions of the amygdala react to the stimulus and send a message to the central nucleus of the amygdala. And the central nucleus transmits information to brainstem centers. 
Um, there are three emotional responses that are emo evoked. From the central gray pathway, we get the emotional behaviors, the fear. From the lateral hypothalamus pathway, that's where we get the autonomic response. And then finally, the bed nucleus, the striaterminalis pathway, is where the hormonal responses come from. The striaterminalis, by the way, is really important for anxiety more so than fear and anger. Anxiety disorders seem to have more striaterminalis activation. So these are the two roads for anxiety here. As you know, there are, or, or fear, I'm sorry, not anxiety. Whenever it comes to the circuitry of fear, you have a high road and a low road. The low road is really primal things that cause fear, like, you know, a centipede appears, you know, on your, your um, um, picnic blanket. That's kind of hardwired. Most people get scared when a centipede sneaks up on them, especially a really big centipede, right? Um, there's another type of fear, though, which is high road. That's whenever you process something cognitively with your cerebral cortex. It goes to the sensory cortex up here in blue, and then it makes it back to the amygdala. And processing of it is what makes you scared. Um, a great example of that, there was actually a horror film where somebody calls the police because there's a murderer who's trying to get them and the police said, don't worry about it. Lock all your doors. We'll trace the phone call. We'll figure out exactly where they're at. And then they said, we figured where, where they're at. They're inside a home at the residence. And the person says, that's my address. And then they get really scared. They realize they locked, the, they locked the killer in their house. And they're somewhere in there. So um, this is different. This is the high road to fear. The low road is when the information goes directly from the thalamus to the amygdala. And again, the central gray leads to the emotional behavior, the lateral hypothalamus, the autonomic response, and then the bed nucleus, the striaterminalis, leads to this hormonal response, more of an anxious response. Now the neural circuitry has been studied for other emotions as well. Disgust in humans activates the insula, Insula is actually inside of um, the cortex, and then the putamen. Um, laughter activates the prefrontal cortex. One of the reasons laughter is really good when you're teaching. One of the things I really like about listening to Robert Sapolsky is he can get you to laugh, and that activates the prefrontal cortex, and that probably carries over to encoding skills. So I think it's really important that you laugh a lot whenever you're learning something, because it's going to help you to appreciate it better. Um, now, the two cerebral hemispheres process emotions differently. The right hemisphere discerns other people's emotions, but the left side of the face is controlled by the right hemisphere, and therefore it's more expressive than the right. And we have really good research demonstrating that. Um, again, the two hemispheres differ in emotional tone as well. So damage to the left hemisphere tends to produce depressive symptoms, and patients with damage to the right hemisphere are very cheerful. Keep in mind the left hemisphere we're going to talk about a lot more when we get to the language chapter. Right hemisphere gets more attention in the emotions chapter because the right hemisphere is more involved in emotions, whereas the left hemisphere is more involved in language. Um, as a matter of fact, when Roger Sperry accepted his Lifetime Achievement Award on this research, he said to the audience, my right hemisphere has no words for what it's feeling right now. And uh, people erupted <laughs> into laughter because he was being completely accurate. And it was so accurate, you kind of have to laugh at it. So... So the hemispheres differ in recognition of emotions and vocal messages, and the right hemisphere is better at identifying the emotional tone, and the left is better at interpreting the meaning of the message. So um, one of the incidental findings about that is that individuals who develop aphasia, which is generally caused by left hemisphere lesions, those same individuals tend to be better at lie detecting. Because when you are trying to analyze somebody's honesty, it's oftentimes more useful 
to look at the paralinguistic behavior. Um, the mouth is oftentimes the tool of deception and manipulation, whereas the facial expressions and body movements are much more useful for figuring out whether somebody's actually honest. But each ear projects more strongly to the opposite hemisphere. Visual stimuli also produce different reactions. So the right hemisphere tends to react more quickly and accurately. It's better at discriminating facial expressions and others. And it's dominant in expressing emotions. And that's the reason that the left side of our face expresses more emotion. If we take composite images of this boy's left side of his face and composite images of his right side of his face over on the right side, we find the ones on the left side are much more useful to figure out which emotion he's experiencing. Do you see how on the left side that's a much more expressive face? That's because those are left sides. They're hardwired to right side, uh, right hemisphere. So uh, this is the original in the center here. Now different emotions are accompanied by differences and brain activity. And emotions such as love or envy can bilaterally increase activity in some areas and decrease activities in others. Another um, really sad, ironic finding is that when people do fall in love, the prefrontal cortex usually slows down, and becomes less active. So um, if you have a friend who's heartstruck or recently fallen in love, um, some of their behaviors are probably associated with the fact that their, their frontal lobes are probably not shifting into third gear anymore. So areas that are really important for emotions, I'm going to just point some of these ones out. Um, the orbital region of the prefrontal cortex, that's going to be the orbital prefrontal gyrus, is really important um, uh, for emotions, particularly inhibiting them. We also have the anterior cingulate cortex right here, which is really important for emotions too. And if we're looking at functional imaging, we can't leave out the posterior cingulate because it also plays an um, instrumental role in the processing of emotions. So these are some of the big areas for processing emotions here. Um, now there was a, a study in the textbook. This is the study. It's a really great study. It's by Antonio Damasio. And uh, he looks at functional brain imaging. He looks to see which areas of the brain are actually activated during um, different emotional states. Um, so brain activation during sadness, happiness, anger, and fear show several distinct regions that are involved. But the same brain region may participate in different emotions. Um, you don't have to memorize these. Once a student gave a presentation on the study, and he was really, really eager to make sense out of this, and he concluded um, very persuasively that it's hard to really make interpretations because there's so much overlap, but there are some of them there. When a person's sad, the anterior cingulate is more active, but the posterior is less active. Um, in the case of happiness, there's uh, more right posterior cingulate activation, more left insula activation, in fear, there's more activation of the midbrain, but less activation of the orbital frontal region. And in sadness, increased pons activity, as well as left anterior cingulate activity. I don't know what these mean. It seems like you could have researchers um, discuss this for quite some time. There's not any clear patterns. Um, but this is a sort of research that is being done, and again, Antonio Damasio has really done a lot of research in this area. So another emotion that needs to be talked about, aggression. So aggression has different meanings, and the primary focus here is physical aggression and violence between individuals exclusive of predation. So we're not including feeding behavior. Right, So when a shark attacks a human being, it's usually because it thinks that it's going to get food and it's hungry. That's predation. That's actually not um, um, inter-male aggression uh, like you would see between human beings. It's kind of interesting. When I used to surf regularly, people would ask me, are you afraid of sharks? And, you know, sometimes I feel like saying, you know, not so much. Like, 
honestly, I think people can be a lot scarier than sharks. I mean, sharks, generally speaking, don't like intentionally commit mass murders or, you know, things like that. And usually they're just trying to get something to eat. Um, so now androgens seem to increase aggression, but the correlation in humans is less clear. Um, two confounding variables, experience and dominance, affect testosterone levels, and winners show higher levels than losers. So um, whenever somebody wins a confrontation, they're more likely to have an increase in testosterone levels. However, testosterone levels are increased by anything that promotes your social status. For instance, if you are a preacher and you go on uh, an extra mission that year that's extra difficult and extra long, when you complete it, you will actually end up with higher testosterone levels. Now, if you're a pro football player, you probably raise your testosterone levels by running people over or tackling people. Um, it's a lot different, but again, uh, testosterone levels increase whenever your, your stats get better. Now, there's a negative correlation between serotonin and aggression, and mice lacking serotonin tend to be hyperaggressive. There's research by um, Seaver that actually shows that there's a certain pattern you tend to find with aggression when it looks at serotonin levels. There's like a, a ratio of B receptor activation to A receptor activation. And uh, low serotonin levels are found in humans in alcohol-induced violence, excessive military violence, and in children with poor impulse control. I want to take this moment to point out that testosterone and alcohol, neither of them invents violence. Some people believe, well, when you drink, you become a violent drunk or you act aggressively. And some people think that if you have higher levels of testosterone, you're going to be more aggressive. That's not the case. The only time we find that relationship is whenever somebody expects the alcohol or testosterone to influence them to be more aggressive, or whenever somebody has a history of aggressive behavior. Now, what about people who are on metabolic steroids? You know, these testosterone derivative uh, drugs. Um, didn't you say, Dr. DeBellis, earlier in the semester that these individuals have been exonerated for murder because they were on loads and loads of anabolic steroids? I did, but two points I'd like to make. First of all, just because a jury exonerated them does not mean that that's the final chapter and that that was definitely a good decision. And the second one is Loads and loads, loads and loads of these testosterone derivative drugs are so many times higher than a normal elevation in testosterone. You can't really even compare them. The level of uh, paranoia, agitation, irritability that one has whenever they um, use anabolic steroids, especially high levels like you find with certain um, athletes, um, that's not representative of heightened testosterone levels. Now, emotional discontrol syndrome refers to temporal lobe disorders that may underlie some human violence. Um, so an example of this, sometimes when people have um, untreated um, seizures for an extended period of time, they will actually develop a disorder where they will actually become more aggressive. It's one of the reasons it needs to be treated. I actually saw this uh, whenever I was doing one of my assessments my first year of graduate school. There was an individual who um, had uh, not been receiving any sort of treatment. The attorney um, basically explained the kind of an interesting situation. The person sounded like they were confessing to an attempted murder when I was assessing them. I think it was like the week of uh, competency exams. So it's like, okay, I just want to focus on prepping for oral exams. That's like my primary thing. And I don't want anything else going on. I want to just stay focused and, and be extra prepared and nothing bad will happen, hopefully. And then I'm doing an assessment. And it sounds like the person's 
confessing to a, an attempted murder. Oh no. So it's just, just the kind of thing you have nightmares about during a, a exam week. So I proceed, I call his attorney, I try to explain to the attorney, he's telling me that he like uh, lacerated somebody really bad with the knife. And, and then the attorney actually was explaining, oh yeah, he was having a seizure. Um, so he, you know, accidentally cut some guy, you know, poor guy, he, he was having a seizure, and I was like, what? But no, he told me what he yelled at the person when he lacerated them, and it didn't sound like he accidentally cut his buddy because he was having a seizure. It sounds like he stalked the person all the way across the East Bay and started screaming in rage as he committed it. Um, really... What the attorney was trying to say was this individual had a long-standing history of seizure disorder, and they refused to get treatment for it. And as a result, they ended up with this uh, personality disorder that was caused by not controlling their seizures. Um, it's a, an emotional discontrol syndrome. And, and really, that's what part of Now, I'm not saying it entirely accounts for everything, but it certainly is a medical issue that had to be pulled into context and understood. So, how about psychopaths? People incapable of experiencing remorse, they commit very violent acts. Have you ever wondered what their story is? Well, there it is right there. So, um, the classic example of the antisocial personality disorder would be um, Ted Bundy. So, he was... Uh, Born in 1946, put to death in 89. He was an American serial killer, kidnapper, rapist, burglar, necrophile. He assaulted and uh, murdered numerous females um, in the 70s, possibly earlier. Um, but shortly before his execution, after more than a decade of denials, he confessed to 30 homicides, and he was put to death. Um, one of the things that struck people about Ted Bundy is he was so articulate and he was so um, kind of sophisticated. There was a refinement to him that persuaded many. For instance, police officers were actually uh, willing to let him go to the library to do research for his case uh, because they felt that he obviously did not belong in prison. Um, he worked on a suicide hotline, believe it or not. Psychologists actually rated him on how compassionate he was and how well he could help the callers. Um, when he was actually put to death, um, if you watch the video, um, the judge actually tells him, you know, you're so articulate and smart. I feel like, you know, you would be a welcome addition with my staff here, you know, but, you know, you committed murder. And um, one of the things about the antisocial personality and sociopaths is they don't experience remorse, which is what I talked about earlier. Um, now, sometimes you assess this using tests. Sometimes you don't need to. Um, a patient once exclaimed to me that they had never killed anyone who didn't have it coming to them, even in prison. Um, this is an admission of lack of guilt, no remorse for committing, you know, murder, many murders. So this is what you would see in the case of antisocial or um, psychotic behavior. Now, sociopathy refers to individuals who are um, in the legal system. It's not a psychological term. It's a legal term. Now, whenever it comes to stress, we're going to switch gears here. We're going to about, talk about stress as it affects behavior and health. The general adaptation syndrome was adopted by Hans Selye. Hans Selye said that um, an individual in the first stage, um, their immune system's adaptive response to stress, uh, there's an initial stressor, then there's a compensation, which is the onset shock. Phase three is the resistance, and finally there's a decompensation phase. Um, now, there were some problems with this theory. It probably cost him a Nobel Prize because um, his theory um, 
was incomplete. There were some problems with it. Now we prefer the um, allostasis model. But he said we had an alarm reaction, and it's the initial response, and it's followed by the adaptation stage, which is acetylcholine. And the exhaust, uh, exhaustion stage is this reaction to the prolonged stress. Now, under stress, the hypothalamus produces corticotropin releasing hormone, which causes the release of adrenocorticotropic hormone from the anterior pituitary, leading to cortisol release. You probably remember this. Um, this is uh, something we went over for the chapter on hormones. But growth hormone, epinephrine and norepinephrine, are also released as well. It's one of the reasons that um, individuals under a great deal of stress oftentimes will uh, not be as, as tall, will not be as large if they're under stress when they're young. So whenever somebody jumps out of an airplane, the um, sympathetic response occurs, right? The reproductive um, organs stop working. This is not a good time to uh, be focused on those functions. Um, the stomach, the intestines quit absorbing nutrients. Again, um, digesting your food is not so important. However, the heart rate increases. Respiration rate increases. Bronchial tubes dilate. This is the sympathetic response. The adrenal glands uh, pump out um, adrenaline and uh, this is the sympathetic response. Now, if we look at an individual's norepinephrine levels after the first jump, um, what we find out um, is before the training, um, there's not a very high level of norepinephrine. Before that day's jump, there's a high level, which is lower after that day's. However, the, the second time they jump, they have lower levels um, before the jump and slightly higher after. Um, and eventually, they have an overall decreased amount of norepinephrine output per um, jump. It's like they habituate it. They, they adjust to it. Hormone level, or the growth hormone levels also reduce um, over subsequent jumps. Endocrine response actually um, Cortisol levels also diminish after subsequent jumps. So there's this adaptation. Testosterone levels are not lowered uh, as much after 11 jumps. Um, so as we can see, autonomic activation during stress actually changes. Um, we actually will have less of an activation over subsequent stressors. So um, we also find that um, there's an increase of epinephrine when you're on a crowded train. This probably isn't so surprising. Um, imagine how high that is now during shelter in place. Um, so uh, um, now stress interferes with immune functioning. For instance, there was a study that was done on um, dental students. Some dental students were just in the middle of their dental training. Another group was getting ready for the boards. And the boards are very difficult. They're very stressful. If you fail them, it's a really, really awful experience. So incisions were placed in the roofs of all of their mouths, and it was noticed that individuals who were undergoing boring, um, they actually would have slower healing of the wound. Individuals who um, uh, were not under as much stress would heal quicker. So. This is one of the reasons I always encourage students, don't save your papers. Don't save your preparation for the last week of school because that's when everybody is sick. You're more likely to contract sickness and your immune functioning is most compromised at the very end of the semester. Therefore, you want to kind of um, avoid that. Try to be a little more conscientious by anticipating you probably might get sick during exam week. Now, stress immunization is the idea that mild stress early in life makes it easier to handle stress later in life. Um, and the reason for this is not necessarily the stress itself. It's actually due to the soothing and grooming behavior that occurs subsequent to the stress. So that's when uh, healthy parents model good 
soothing skills or grooming skills, and they teach coping skills, and that's the value of it. Um, research even shows, there's research by Siri et al. that shows that individuals who don't have enough stress actually are possibly at a disadvantage because they don't learn these skills. Now, psychosomatic medicine emphasizes the role of psychological factors in disease, and health psychology studies the psychological influence on health. So, um, in psycho, neuroimmunology is a, a big field. It's a really popular field, gaining popularity, and it studies the interaction of the immune as well as the nervous systems. So, but the bodily defense systems, they interact with each other. Genetic factors have a multifactorial, bidirectional influence on endocrine factors, immune functioning, the nervous system. Um, as well as endocrine factors affect these as well. What that means is, for instance, if your immune system's compromised, that can actually um, influence your cognitive functioning, right? And, and when your cognitive functioning is failing on you, that can also affect your immune system as well. It's bi-directional. So stressors such as social stress, microbes, toxins, um, poor, poor nutrition, they can all affect any one of these, and those then will affect the others, leading to health consequences. We as psychologists generally are referred to as behavioral medicine. Uh, we work in hospitals where we help people to deal with these things. Um, now, main features of the immune system include different white blood cells. We have phagocytes, which... Uh, are eating cells. They engulf and destroy invading germs. We have B lymphocytes, which are referred to as B cells. They're formed in bone marrow and they produce antibodies that latch onto foreign molecules. And then they destroy the foreign molecules. And finally, T lymphocytes, also called T cells, um, they're formed in the thymus gland and they act as killer cells that attack foreign substances. And whenever they do that, they also secrete cytokines um, that send signals to protein that regulate the activity of these B lymphocytes and phagocytes. So, so the, that's what the immune system does. It's really important. Um, so the brain affects the immune system through these autonomic nerves and monitors immune reactions. And the immune system acts as a sensory receptor system informing the brain. And the brain and the immune system also interact with endocrine system. And uh, although that achy, lethargic feeling that we have with the flu is unpleasant, it has an adaptive function because it, it compels us to rest. And oftentimes when we're sick or whether we're concussed, the best thing that we can actually do is rest and recover. Um, Excessive quantities of cytokines also play a role in depression. It's something we might talk about more when we talk about the topic in a later chapter. So as you can see, the nervous system, the endocrine system, the immune system interact with each other in a, a bi-directional manner. And uh, hormones released during stress can suppress the immune system. And uh, this acts as a short-term defense mechanism, allowing resources to be used elsewhere, and uh, long-term stress is detrimental to immune functioning, and it can uh, weaken, uh, it can weaken our health at the level of the chromosomes by dissolving telomeres, and, and I want you to also watch uh, Robert Sapolsky's um, Stress the Portrait of a Killer, because you're going to um, be able to see this uh, research on the telomeres I think it's Dr. Um, um, Eagle, who actually, um, Eppel, Dr. Eppel, who actually does this research. So it's a really great um, uh, video that's highly relevant to what we've learned in this chapter. So um, remember, the principal components of the stress response are mobilization of energy, increasing cardiovascular and cardiopulmonary tone, suppressing digestion and growth and reproduction and immunity. Also, the stress response leads to analgesia and neural responses like ultracognition and sensory thresholds. But the 
physiological consequences of prolonged stress are fatigue, hypertension, ulcers, which you'll learn more about in Sapolsky's video, psychogenic dwarfism, suppression of ovulation, apathy, and neural degeneration of the hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. Um, prolonged stress also can lead to uh, vascular issues like cerebrovascular disease, which is the second most common form of uh, dementia. So these are really important. They're very relevant to what we're dealing with right now. And um, closing thoughts. Psychological stress such as depression, grief, or um, decreased immune function. Some behavioral patterns such as the type A or type D um, uh, the type A, by the way, is marked excessive drive, impatience, hostility. It's associated with heart disease. So um, there was a lot of research on the type A personality, as well as uh, the type a B personality are more relaxed, less aggressive. They're more likely to get cancer than heart disease. And then finally, you find type D is a tendency toward negative feelings coupled with strong social inhibition. And there's a link there if you get a chance if you look up the type A personality in upholsterers, you actually find there's a link to a really cool video by Sapolsky about what the type A personality was and uh, how the primary determinant of heart disease was actually a toxic hostility more so than the competitiveness and impatience. So here's a link to National Geographic Portrait of a Killer. You can get it on uh, YouTube. Just type in Stress the Portrait of a Killer. It's about 58 and a half minutes long. You can watch it for free. And content from it could be on your quiz. But for your study guide, remember, what are examples of positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia? Um, or I'm sorry. Um, those ones are not the ones that you need there. Um, okay, what you need for your study guide, what results from damage to the amygdala, what emotions have been evolutionary beneficial to warning us about impending danger, uh, what is Plitchek credited for, what are Ekman's universal emotions, what are microexpressions, know what Bell's palsy is, know what individual response stereotype is, be familiar with the facial feedback hypothesis and attribution model, and then know the different types of, um, and then also know whether polygraph tests are reliable. And those are study guide questions to know for this particular chapter. So I want to thank you for your time. I find this to be a really fun chapter. Um, it deals with a lot of material that doesn't really receive enough attention. I want to thank you for taking the time to go over this chapter with me, and I encourage you to watch that video. Again, Robert Sapolsky's The Portrait of a Killer, which you can um, find on um, YouTube. Thank you so much.